Greetings, ANRC members, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome all the participants. My name is Lily Urbilajit, Vice President of National Science and Technology Development Agency or NASDA, and also your MC for this event. It is my pleasure to welcome you here today. We appreciate your attention and joining us for the 2021 conference of the Asian Network of Research Resource Centers. The theme of this year conference is Beyond COVID-19, Sustainable Research Resources Management for Bio-Circular Green Economy, or BCG. So there are two reasons why we have chosen the BCG to incorporate in the theme of the ANRC 2021 this year. Uh, firstly, Thailand has announced BCG economy model as one of the national agendas. And the government intends to use BCG to create self-reliance, build resilience, and, the, and expedite recovery from the pandemic. The BCG model utilizes science, technology, and innovation to drive the national development, focusing on conservation, rehabilitation, utilization, and management, as well as value creation of biological and cultural diversity. The second reason is because Thailand will be the host of Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, or APEC, in 2022. Sustainable growth and responsibility, including development of the Bio-Circular Green Economy, or BCG, are one of the issues that Thailand will be proposing in the APEC meeting. Therefore, I believe our conference today will significantly emphasize the importance of our network as well as sharing the concept of BCG economy among the ANRC network and how the research resource centers will support the global sustainable development even in the crisis. So before we start the event, allow me to introduce you to Dr. Narong Siri Rudwarakun, president of NASDA. Apart from being the NASDA president, Dr. Narong also holds numerous important positions, such as an advisor to the subcommittee to the, of the National Research Science and Innovation of Thailand Senate, corresponding member of the European Association of Research and Technology Organization, IETO, and advisory board member of the Global Young Academy, and also member and secretaries of Thailand's National Biocircular Green Economy Policy Board. May I now invite Dr. Narong Sivirat Warakun to deliver the welcome remarks. Dr. Yon Hee Lee, founder and former president of ANRRC, distinguished guests, speakers, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the National Science and Technology Development Agency on NASDA, I would like to welcome all of you to the ANRRC 2021 International Meeting, organized under the theme, Beyond COVID-19, Sustainable Resource, Resources Management for Bio-Circular Green Economy. The meeting today aims to explore the potential of Bio-Circular Green Economy, or BCG, in rebuilding the sustainable economies and society post-pandemic as well as getting us ready and resilient to unforeseen future challenges. ANRC is well known for its success in connecting resource, resource centers and institutes across Asia Pacific region since 2009. Its mission and goal contribute greatly to academic exchange for information and technologies and discovery of resources related to human, animals, plants, microorganisms, and non-biological materials in Asia. As the BCG model is based on applying BCG concept to create economy value to resources while conserving the environment and ensuring inclusiveness, ANRC is thought part of the diverse in this effort to achieve sustainable development goals. The Thai government introduced BCG model as a strategy for the national development 
and post-pandemic recovery. And early this year, it was declared a national agenda. At the Secretariat of the National BCT Policy Board, NASDAQ has developed the BCT Action Plan that aims to promote sustainability for biological resources, strengthen communities and grassroot economies, enhance sustainable competitiveness of Thai BCT industry, and build resilience to global changes. In this connection, NASA is honored to be hosting this international gathering with the theme Addressing BCT. This is a phenomenal opportunity for us to strengthen, to explore, and to promote our research collaboration agenda and mission on mutual interest among ANRC members. Before I end my speech, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to distinguished speakers who will soon share with us that knowledge and wisdom to enthusiastic researchers who joined the poster session, to everyone associate institution, and to everyone here for your support in this event. I wish you a success meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Narong, for the warm remarks. Before we proceed to our first session, may I inform you that you can have your e-proceeding of the today's event through our ANRC 2021 webpage. And if you have any questions or would like to share your point of view with our distinguished speakers today, please leave your message in the Q&A box located on your right side of the WebEx screen. And your questions will be shared to the speakers after the presentation ends. And if your questions specific to any speakers, please also mention. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a privilege to introduce our first distinguished speakers for the special event, Professor Yong Hee Lee, founder and former president of ANRC. Professor Lee is an important figure in microbiology and resource management in Korea and international organizations, having served in, um, in key positions such as the president of Microbiological Society of Korea and the president of Federation of Microbiological Society of Korea. She has been recognized with several domestic and international awards, uh, including ISBER Awards for Outstanding Achievement in Biobank and UNESCO L'Oreal World Branding Forum Award. Pro Professor Lee will deliver a special presentation on the history of ANRC from the start to the present and what's been done with ISO TC276. Please welcome Professor Lee. I am very honored to give a plenary lecture at the 12th ANRC meeting. I'm Professor Yanni Lee at Seoul Women's University and the founding president of ANRC. Also, I am a member of ISO TC276 Biotechnology. Today, I want to remember with you what we have done from the start of ANRC until today. And also, I want to share the information by ISO TC276, especially Working Group 2 Biobanking and Bioresources. First, I want to go back to the start of ANRC. ANRC has 16 countries and 106 BRCs in human, animal, plant, and microbes. And these are the 16 countries, Korea, Japan, China, India, Indonesia, Malaysia, Mongolia, Pakistan, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, Vietnam, Nepal, Azerbaijan, Australia, and New Zealand. And we have four committees, IT, Biobanking, Biodiversity and Regulation, International Affairs, and Standardization. I want to share my memory with everybody in ANRC. Let's remember the first time we met at Seoul. In cold winter, January 2009, KNRC invited nine countries 
and had an ad hoc meeting with 40 people. I contacted embassies and asked to recommend the best person for ANRC. Everybody at the ad hoc meeting agreed that we need a network for BRC. So the first ANRC was held at Coex Center Seoul, Korea in the same year, September 2009. At this time, 300 participants from 12 countries participated. At this meeting, three countries, China, Japan, Korea, signed an MOU to collaborate for ANRRC. The second meeting was held in October 2010 at Tsukuba Riken BRC, Japan, with 120 participants from 12 countries. At the meeting, I was designated as the first president of ANRC and the ANRC charter was adapted. In November 2011, we had third annual meeting at IMCAS Beijing, China. We had 130 participants from 12 countries. The fourth meeting was held in October 2012 at Shinebe Resort, Jeju Island, Korea with 218 participants from 18 countries. In 2012, ANRC signed the affiliate agreement with ISPR at Vancouver, Canada, and Australia and New Zealand joined ANRC, and Dr. Obata was elected as the second president of ANRC. In 2013, we had the fifth annual meeting in October at Yahama, Kanakawa, Japan, with 128 participants from 15 countries. In September 2014, we had the sixth annual meeting in Shanghai, China, with 186 participants from 11 countries. I hope everybody to remember the beautiful night of Shanghai. The seventh meeting was held in September 2015, Songdo Konbensia, Incheon, Korea, with 186 participants from 14 countries. Dr. George Dagger, the convener of ISO TC2 Disease Working Group 2, was one of the speakers. In September 2016, the eighth meeting was held in NIG, National Institute of Genetics, to Japan with 100 participants from 13 countries. At this meeting, Dr. Liu at IMCAS China was elected as the third president. In 2016, ANRC was acknowledged as category A liaison of ISO TC276. The ninth meeting was held in September at IMCAS Beijing China with 200 participants from 11 countries. The 10th annual meeting was held in September 2018 at Seoul, Korea, with 156 participants from 11 countries. The 11th meeting was at Southeast Asian Regional Center for Graduate Study and Research in Agriculture, Philippines, with 137 participants from nine countries. At this meeting, Dr. Shiroshi Toshiko was elected as the fourth president starting from 2021. I hope everybody to remember the beautiful dancers at the reception. In 2020, we had unbelievable worldwide problem caused by COVID-19 so we had to skip the annual meeting. Now, today, NSTDA Thailand has organized the 12th meeting. I really appreciate NSTDA for all the efforts for this meeting. I'm sure ANRC will last forever as long as people do research and development. And ANRC will play an important role worldwide. On the second part of my talk, I will share information about the ISO guidelines for BRCs, especially 
produced by ISO TC276. ISO TC276 started in 2013. The chairman has been Dr. Gent, and secretary is Ms. Lena Krieger. In TC276, we have five working group, and the George Dagger has been working as convener for working group two. The working group one is for terms and definition. Two is for biobanks and bioresources. And three for analytical method. Four is bioprocessing. And five for data processing. And the future one is six for metrology. Five working groups need collaboration with each other. For example, working group two, the data from working group two needs help from the working group five. In the analytical method and bioprocessing guidelines, those guidelines can be used, must be used in working group two. For example, cell counting guidelines can be used, are being used in working group two. At present, TC276 have 32 P members and 17 O members. Among 16 countries in ANRC, five countries are P member and two countries are O members. I want to show you documents produced by ISO TC276 up to now. Some guidelines produced by working groups other than working group two are not related to BRCs, but most of them are for biobanking and bioresources. These are the guidelines by USA. So there is a guideline which are TR, technical report, the ISO guideline, and TS, technical specification, TS. This TS and TR will be used for three years. And if they evaluated as important, then it will be developed into ISO in the future. So the guidelines by USA, the ISO 20391, part one and part two. These are the guidelines on cell counting. So these cell counting guidelines will be used in working group two, especially for cell line bank, including mesenchymal cell and pluripotent cell. And China worked as a project leader for these guidelines. Among these, 21710, that's a data management for microbial BRCs. And when it says DTS, it means it is almost done and will be published too soon. So in this case, this is for animal microbiological material. And like this one, walking draft, which is the prior to DTS, it is nucleic synthesis. And walking draft TS22859, that's mesenchymal stroma cells. And another one is the plant biological material. And the cell line authentication guideline is also under development. The others are like this one like DIS24603, that's for the human and mouse pluripotent stem cell. And this is the guidelines which are producing by the Germany. And this is the French, French guideline, especially this one is the most important one, the top umbrella guideline 
2023A7. That's for general requirement for biobanking. So several countries is already started to accreditation for biobanking, the BRC, under this guideline. And also Japan is working as the project leader for these guidelines. And by Korea, especially these two one, two guidelines are produced by me. The 21709 is for the mammarian cell line and the DIS 24088A is for the BRCs for microbiology, especially for bacteria and RT. And new proposal has been suggested and also for the working group five, the data processing has been suggested by Korea. These guidelines are produced by other countries. As you can see, many guidelines have been produced that these for the management for BRCs, techniques for sample treatment and preservation. These guidelines will help our ANRC BRC to be upgraded. And any member in ANRC can give comment or advice to working group two or work as project leader or member for a new guideline. I hope everybody had time to remember how wonderful time we had together. And I'm sure we will have more in the new future. Thank you very much. Again, thank you very much, especially for Thailand, and hope to meet everyone in person soon. Thank you, Professor Lee, for sharing the great memory of the ANRC conference in the previous years, and also sharing your wealth of knowledge of ISO TC 276. We seem to have a lot to follow up with all update documents of this ISO TC 276. Are there any questions for Professor Lee? Um, I mean, for the audience, for the participants, please feel free to uh, write it down in the Q&A box or the speakers and executive board, you are free, free to ask questions, uh, you know, like just, just, just turn on your microphone and ask questions. Okay, while we are waiting for questions from the audience, may I start to ask you questions? Professor Lee, mm -hmm. can you hear me? Okay, so as the founder of ANRC, you have promoted and supported several activities to support scientific community. So could you share some example briefly on how ANRC supports the development of the young scientists? Thank you. Well, uh, I try to give opportunity for young scientists to participate in ANRC. It's very difficult for them to go abroad and meet the foreign scientists. So through this ANRC, we can share, and also the young scientists from different country, they can share their experience and what's going up, what's been going out, because most of them they are just to study and do the research in their own lab. It's very difficult to go out and meet the real scientists outside. So it's very important for them to invite ANRC. And especially at this time, the, the June meeting can, but we can hold as many as people, 1,000 people at the same time. I hope many young scientists participate this one, but I cannot see any young face at this time. So I hope next <laughs> June meeting, perhaps we can invite them and show them that, that we need guidelines, we need research, and so like that one, so I hope everybody get more energy and more, what is it, experience from old people like me to what can be done with their experience. Right. Great answer. Thank you very much. And you've been a really uh, 
role model for a young scientist uh, everywhere. I think that that's a great work that you've done. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for your great presentation. I'm afraid that we have, that's all we have time for this session. And um, so thank you again, Professor Lee. And for the next keynote session, I'm delighted to have with us two distinguished keynote speakers who will give us insightful and informative presentation on biotechnology and related topics. Uh, the first keynote speaker is Professor Ying Li from Institute of Microbiology, Chinese Academy of Science in CAS. Professor Li holds a PhD degree in fermentation engineering from Jiangnan University and was appointed as a visiting professor by Cornell University uh, in the US. His research interests are in the uh, industrial biotechnology with focus on conversion of carbon dioxide into organic matter aimed at developing novel biocatalysts that contribute to development of sustainable bio-based manufacturing industries. Currently, Professor Lee is serving as a member of the Scientific Board of International Basic Science Program of UNESCO, member of International Advisory Council of Global Bioeconomy and director of CAS TWS Center of Excellence of Biotechnology. So Professor Yin Li, the stage is yours. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, could you give me the authorization for sharing? Yeah, I'm starting sharing. Or in the global bioeconomy concepts, and I think this is this has been great uh, presentation. Thank you. But I'm afraid that we, uh, okay, there is some questions though. Okay, we have a very like very limited time. Okay, but I will uh, put the questions up here. But I could maybe read for now for you. Uh, so the questions in Q and A box would be on the bio photovoltaic voltage, right? Okay, so the question is the bio photovoltaics, uh, is itself uh, sustainable, sustain, or do we need to constantly add food source to the system? Professor Lee, would you yes, get that yes. question? Okay, uh, thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, in the, uh, in principle, it can be self-sustain, because as I said, the CO2 can be recycled. Uh, we are now already developed a new generation of the bio photovoltaics, uh, which has a higher output than what I reported, uh, which has achieved a higher sustainability. Uh, wow. that. So in principle, what we are envisaging is uh, this is something that we can put into the outer space, for instance, into the Mars. Eh? Okay. I think there is one more question there. Okay, did you see the, okay, why the plant, can you hear me though, Professor Lee? Okay, yes, yes, so why yes. the plant rubisco enzymes are so lazy? <laughs> yeah, I think they, they adapted to the nature because in nature, the solar energy is a very low density energy. It's only available in the daytime. And so, so in nature, they don't have a strong energy which allow them to fix carbon uh, rapidly. So, so they rather do it slowly. Well, what synthetic biology try to change this model, we try to put high density energy from electricity, and we try to increase the speed so as we can realize in an industrial scale rather than the agricultural uh, scale. Okay, thank you very much. That's all we have time for. Thank you, thank you. Professor thank you Lee, much. for the very informative presentation. Thank you all. Thank you. So. Now I would like to move to the next speaker. So our next keynote speaker that I'm proud to introduce is Dr. Philip Desmet from Belgian uh, Science Policy Office or BELSPO. Dr. Philip Desmet is a bioengineer and environmental consultant by training. And among his several expertises, Dr. Desmet has also developed within the BELSPO uh, procedures and schemes for equitable and sustainable collaboration with institutions in developed and developing countries and master in access and benefit sharing in the context of the Convention of Biological Diversity or CBD and the Nagoya Protocol. He is an active member for, of several international scientific advisory boards in many countries, including in France, Thailand and Belgium. 
and the former president of the World Federation of Cultural Collections or the WFCC and currently serves as an ex-official member of the WFCC executive board. So, Dr. Philip Desmeth, very good to see you and now the stage is yours. Uh, Yes, okay. okay. <laughs> Connected. Uh, no, it will be, uh, it's a pleasure for me to join you all today. Uh, I'm connecting. Okay. okay. Yes, that's coming. You have okay. a full screen? No, uh, it's actually a presenter screen. Yeah, okay, I will move. You should get the full screen now. Okay, that's it. Yeah, we got the full okay. screen. Thank you. <laughs> now, after one year of COVID-19 uh, pandemic, you get used with the online system. Anyway, it's a, it's a great pleasure uh, for me to, to join you all today. And of course, to see even if it's only virtually Professor Yoni Lee and uh, I, I would say that I will try to get this. Okay, maybe, and you get the better screen. At uh, from uh, extensive experience, Professor Lee will certainly agree with me that biobank have been resilient and proactive in the face of uh, legal and societal change uh, over the past decades. So my talk today will, will go on the specific challenge and opportunity created by the access and benefit sharing uh, concept. That's what's uh, set uh, by the Convention on Biological Diversity. Okay, so I'm trying to, okay. So uh, I will just present in brief the ABS concept and then focus on two role of uh, biobanks is uh, providing material and providing data to the scientific uh, community. Uh, concerning the concept of access and benefit sharing, in short, ABS, uh, the Convention on Biological Diversity that came into force in December 93 uh, created uh, a paradigm shift from uh, open access to sovereign rights, uh, more specifically the CBD Article 50. And so you've got the authority to determine access. The countries have the authority to determine access. Uh, and But at the same time, not to fence but also to create condition to facilitate access. So it's a fence with the door, and it's the country that uh, organized this uh, uh, control so that they can have a balance and a share of, of the benefit sharing with the partners. So, and in 2014, the Nagoya Protocol came into force on in October, 2014. The Convention on Biological Diversity has three objectives of equal importance. And it's important to have this balanced approach um, to move towards conservation, utilization, and benefit sharing coming out of biological diversity. While the Nagoya Protocol focus on the fair and equitable benefit sharing. So there is a risk of imbalance and that we have to keep in mind, not only uh, the police, the, uh, the policing making, but also uh, this all stakeholders. So that uh, we keep in mind that uh, if we want to attain sustainable benefit sharing, we need also uh, to deal appropriately with conservation and utilization of the resources. And there, the biobank have an, a very important 
pivotal role uh, in providing the material. So they have designed specific tools uh, to uh, meet these needs and they have adapted their workflow to handle material as well as data. And uh, biobanks uh, is in uh, the role of biobanks is increasingly important in the transition from fossil fuel based economy to biocircular green economy. We biobanks are central because access to biological resource will be as important as access to energy and water. And we just saw it with the previous uh, speaker that. Uh, energy production uh, will uh, be also uh, made by uh, developing biotechnology. To be efficient ups, biobanks have developed several legal and administrative instruments and have adapted their workflow to handle material as, as well as data. At each stage, of material management from identification, deposit and storage up to distribution. The processing of the material and the recording of relevant data are organized on the one hand to achieve excellence in technical requirements and on the other hand to meet legal requirements and this provide technically and legally adequate material and data. Concerning data, well, uh, biobanks need to collect, store and manage both administrative and scientific data and make them accessible to a variety of actors in the research and innovation change. They need specific software, such as the laboratory information management system. Biobanks have a long tradition of cataloging their, catalog their collections. They have been providing catalogs of their collections since before the existence of the World Wide Web. Catalogs are open windows that make material and data accessible to the global scientific community that needs documented material for upstream and downstream material. And you see the screen of the global catalog of microorganisms managed by the World Data Center for Microorganisms. These catalogs contain administrative information, such as the name of the person who isolated or identified the strain, as well as relevant technical and scientific data. Biobanks are the sum of many efforts, as such they are explicitly mentioned in uh, what was uh, reminded by us by Professor Lee in the ISO 2387 norm, as part of the ABC of biobanking, linking data to biological material. The Nagoya Protocol requires particular attention in this, to the specific data that must be collected, stored and transferred to user of microbial diversity. It's usually what uh, lawyers uh, dealing with the Nagoya Protocol implementation uh, uh, mentioned as seek, keep and transfer administrative data. Basically, these data answer five questions. What is the biological material? Where and when was it collected and by whom? And to whom it is, is it distributed? This information is provided by the biobanks who has developed unique global identifier adapted to their needs. That was done well before the Nagoya Protocol uh, uh, was even designed. And uh, this allows users to find strains of consistent quality that match their requests. 
this is the way to contribute to cumulative research. And so the picture you see can be found at one of the Belgian collections under the code MUCL 43747. So you can link a picture to the material and to uh, relevant data. So faced with uh, these uh, additional burdens, uh, catalogs now have a complementary role to play. They are auxiliaries to law fulfillment as the CBD and the Nagoya protocol are applicable on research and development. Following legal obligation is self-evident and uh, biobanks had a proactive strategy to meet uh, the new uh, regulation set up by the CBD and by the Nagoya protocol. So I give you some example, but there are other efforts made also in, uh, for instance, the NEMA system developed in uh, Southeast Asia and in uh, broader Asia. So that's one way uh, for the biobanks to help facilitating access and legitimate use of the material and the data they, they provide. Uh, and these efforts are also available and recorded in the access and benefit sharing clearinghouse of the Convention on Biological Diversity. But uh, next to uh, having this administrative data, scientists are looking for fair data, which means uh, data that you can easily find, you can easily access, you can interoperate them and you can re reuse them. And this scientific data should be as open as possible, as close as necessary. What does that mean? Is that uh, for the principle of, of science and the economics of science is the creation of knowledge. Certainly in biocircular green economy, in knowledge-based bioeconomy. We must swiftly go from renewable biological resource to sustainable product and services. And therefore, uh, as we just said, uh, we switch from hydrocarbon to nucleic acids, from linear to circular economy, and from material to information. And information, access to information is key. Therefore, and now, nowadays, we face a controversial issue developed in the context of the Nagoya Protocol. It's the so-called digital sequence information. From a scientific point of view, any limitation on access to scientific data may be counterproductive and may go against the way life science work. I think that uh, when you have the question, should the Nagoya Protocol rule the access to digital sequence and information of genetic resource, I think that instead of trying to control the flow of data at huge costs, that will most likely always outweigh the benefit, it would be more efficient, rewarding, and economically sound to improve the transparency and sustainable growth of data. Success are the result of collaborative efforts in open science not protectionism. As Isaac Newton wrote in 1676, if I have been, if I have seen further, it's by standing on the shoulder of giants. An example of powerful scientific open source 
database is the International Nucleotide Sequence Database collaboration with free and unrestricted access to all the data records. No use restriction, permanently accessible, and still with legal check and quality check. We advocate finding the right balance by applying the rules in the real world of work and having the low support responsible science. Let's keep in mind that the balance achievement of the three CBD objective is the best way to move towards sustainability. This means optimal access to material and data supported by law that are designed to take into account the current and future reality of science. Optimal access to material and data and optimal legal definition. That is also an issue concerning the digital sequence information is that <coughs> uh, the term has not real scientific uh, 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 basics. So, to conclude, my take home message for you is that, and it was already specified by the two previous uh, speakers, microbiodiversity offers enormous potential for bio based solutions to socioeconomic challenge in all fields. Biobanks play a central role in research and innovation by providing technically and legally fit for purpose material and data. The Convention on Biological Diversity and the Nagoya Protocol have pushed biobanks to improve their operation. That was the very positive uh, impact on these uh, international agreements on the working of biobanks. Biobanks have also have, uh, been at the forefront in providing solutions that combine better quality, greater transparency and legal certainty. But this has come with additional costs. Improvements are still needed. Improvements are always needed. But it's important that the CBD and the Nagoya Protocol do not become worse than the problem. And <clears throat> Uh, to conclude, uh, to overcome the challenge and effectively fill this basic role in research and innovation, biobanks must organize themselves into collaborative networks to master together the flow of information and resources, to improve communication, to cooperate in designing their contractual rules within changing legal environment and have common capacity building program to reach excellence set by the latest quality law. And these are some of the reasons why the ANRC was established to work together to solve and to, to, to meet, to face the problem and to solve them. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Philip Desmeth, for your great presentation, as always. So, uh, I don't see the questions in the chat box yet, uh, uh, in the Q&A box yet, but um, actually, while we're waiting for that, uh, maybe I can start by, uh, because I, I know that, you know, with the this issue has been, a, you know, there are a lot of uh, questions and a lot of problems in some countries already. Uh, because of this uh, Nagoya protocol and, you know, like, and, and it's conflict with the uh, national regulations as well. And it seems to be difficult for us all as a microbial, um, you know, scientists to, to work and uh, to work and also, you know, try to, for example, if you want to publish the type strain and, you know, you cannot um, deposit that out of some countries or something, you know, and uh, I think uh, it, I agree, totally agree with you that with the, you know, network and consortiums like what we do, either ANRC or WFCC or ACM, this could actually be the uh, great uh, community that could help 
with the you know some of this problem so i wonder you know if we want to start like supporting uh our scientific community with the cbd of course you know raise the awareness and you know maybe we kind of uh uh, bring in the communication more, but what what else we could do to, you know, we don't want to interfere with national regulation for sure, but you know what else we could you know really do. With, you know, I I know that you have a already laid of the uh, you know lay out the fundamental and the concepts of the Nagoya Protocol, but really in practice, can you like name one or two that we could really do in terms of community like us? Well, first of all, thank you for your question. Uh, first of all, I would say that uh, transparent communication is, is important. And the World Data Center for Microorganisms is doing a great job. And NRRC uh, uh, also, uh, WDCM, uh, by uh, putting online and helping the collections to put online uh, their catalogs. Uh, and that's publicly uh, accessible. So anybody who is willing to uh, know uh, where material is can follow it. So it's transparency and that's important. It's important uh, for the provider country as well as for the user. They all know from where it comes and they all know who is using it. Uh, but in, in, in a legal framework, it's it's the same as, as uh, for the working of intellectual property uh, uh, um, rights. You have to uh, give all the information related to the your invention and the counterpart is that you get some privileged use for about 20 years. Uh, in the same way, uh, working transparently in the context of the Nagoya Protocol give you some advantage, but on, at the same time, you share this advantage and the benefit, whatever you call advantage of benefits, with uh, the person who provided you access to the material. So that's one point, transparency. Training is needed. And, and uh, the, the example you mentioned about the type strain, uh, it's also then science and technique can help by uh, the, the work and the program set up by the World Data Center for Microorganisms on, uh, as it was mentioned by uh, Professor Lee, um, on sequencing, on making the whole genome sequence of 10,000 uh, uh, type strains, then you have a very uh, good uh, ID card of the type strain. And when it's exploited somewhere, well, you can match this ID card, this whole genome sequencing, and you can identify from where it comes if it's really a type strain. So there is still uh, an interesting work to do, interesting, well, complex <laughs> work to do on the type strain. How can you, at the same time, facilitate open access to the strain? And at the same time, be sure that uh, the exploitation of the strain will be done uh, in a fair way by providing uh, uh, and returning part of the benefit to all those that have really contributed to uh, the a particular use of the material. So. This example of type strain uh, and the way forward from a scientific point of view, saying, okay, the type strain is important that we have the whole genome sequence because it's important technically and scientifically. Well, this move helps also for the legal issue 
raised by the uh, Nagoya Protocol. So uh, we must see, in conclusion, I would say that we don't need to see uh, an opposition between uh, legal moves and scientific uh, 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 progress. We have just to combine them together. But at the same time, you cannot ask from the scientific community to solve all the problems that the legal the, uh, 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 and the, the, the decision maker are setting up. Because then you take a big part of the budget for scientific research just to meet the administrative purpose. And as it was really nicely shown by Professor Lee, research funding should go to research to find solution for uh, the challenge ahead of us in terms of climate change, in terms of biodiversity loss. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you. I have a technical problem. Actually, I, I have... Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, I, I only have like 30 seconds, but I have one more question from the audience. Uh, can you maybe brief uh, answer this? Uh, in your opinion, has CBD and Nagoya Protocol adequately addressed the issue of benefit sharing? Uh, <laughs> it's difficult to, today, to answer. Today, yeah, today, no, uh, but... Uh, there are two elements. I will be. I will, I will be short. There are two elements. Uh, the Nagoya Protocol is no is not on, the only mechanism that uh, provides uh, balanced benefit sharing, fair benefit sh uh, and equitable sharing of the benefits. There are other mechanisms, such as the intellectual property rights system under the uh, world intellectual property organization. And then secondly, well, uh, for unfortunately, I would say for the people in the fields like us, uh, the Nagoya protocol is still evolving. Uh, so it, I hope it will end up with a, a balanced uh, system, but we have to adapt uh, the mechanism because it's not, uh, fully mature yet. So the ABS system set up under the Nagoya protocol is not the only benefit sharing tool and it's not mature yet. But uh, I'm st I am an optimist, uh, so I think we can achieve uh, a good balance in the future. As so far as decision makers and lawyers are listening to uh, the, the microbiologist, the biologist, uh, to people uh, working in the field. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. for your clear answer and uh, Thank you for your presentation. And now I would like to move on to the next session. And um, we shall proceed to the first session dedicated to the topic of envisioning microbial resource centers in the post-pandemic world. The session will be shared by Dr. Maria Auxilia, Auxilia uh, T. Siranga. And Dr. Oxy, if I may, is the head of microbiological research and service laboratory MRSL Science Research Institute at the University of the Philippines Diliman and uh, of course an executive board member of ANR Good morning, everyone, to the NSPDA officials, the ANRRC executive board members, our distinguished speakers and participants all over the world. Welcome to the first technical session, which is session one of the title Envisioning Microbial Resource Centers in the Post-Pandemic World. This session 
will focus on the roles and challenges, action points, and future directions of a dynamic microbial culture collection or resource center in generating new knowledge and supporting research and the industry. The session will also highlight the utilization of microbial resources in generating wealth through tapping their potentials for biocircular green economy. We have two equally important topics which will be presented by two distinguished experts in the field of microbiology and biotechnology. So let's move on. Our first speaker is the head of the microbial division for the grand collection of microorganisms, JCM, of the Riken Bioresource Research Center in Tsukuba, Japan. Dr. Maria Okuma earned his bachelor's and master's in agricultural chemistry and his doctorate in agriculture at the University of Tokyo. He has held important positions as researcher and scientist at Riken prior to his appointment as the head of JCM. He is also a professor at the University of Tsukuba. Currently, Dr. Okuma heads the, the Japan Society for Microbial Resources and Systematics. Ladies and gentlemen, may I give the virtual platform to Professor Maria Okuma, who will be presenting his lecture entitled Sustainable Development of JCM as a Microbial Research Center over the Pandemic Area. Professor Okuma. Thank you, Maria-san. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. And can you, can you look my slide? Okay. So, uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, express my sincere thanks to all the uh, staff, uh, Lidisan and uh, all the NLC, RLC 2021 staff. Uh, to invite me uh, again uh, this uh, annual meeting. So uh, I'd like to talk about uh, our activity, recent activity, and uh, <clears throat> I'd like to talk about uh, how we uh, develop sustainably over the pan this uh, pandemic area. Okay, this year is uh, it's corresponding to 20th anniversary of Riken BLC. So last year, uh, we indeed had a, a, a anniversary uh, ceremony for the anniversary and the memorial symposiums. And, okay. So uh, JCM is conducted, conducting uh, correction, preservation, quality control, distribution of diverse species of bacteria, archaea, and fungi. Our mission is to contribute to scientific community by serving microbial resources and ensuring the sustainable use in order to promote general microbiology as well as environment and health science. So this is a, uh, this year is the anniversary of the KMPLC, so I would like to look back on uh, the history of uh, our JCM. So JCM was founded as a culture collection in 1981, and we started, uh, we JCM started as a very small culture collection in 2083. We have 610 strains are catalog uh, published a uh, volume of catalogs. And we uh, started the distribution only in a small number of strains. Uh, but we, uh, our staff, JCM staff, uh, led by uh, the first director, Kazuo Komagata, and second director, Takashi Nakase, uh, work, worked very hard. Uh, and also uh, Yoshimi Benno and Kenichiro Suzuki, as a head of the division in JCM also worked very hard uh, to improve or to develop uh, our activity and to reach the uh, JCM as uh, one of the uh, world's uh, most famous uh, cultural collections. And 
2001, he came here, he was formed as a, a, a center for uh, serving the uh, diverse uh, organisms, giving organisms uh, from the mouse, plant, and cell bank, and gene materials and microbes. And JCMs uh, the uh, United was united or integrated into the KMBRC in 2004. And we came to JCM in 2009 as a head of uh, JCM. And soon after that, we experienced uh, great earthquakes in Eastern Japan. And we have a big uh, event in 2012. Uh, we formally uh, present uh, worked in the Riken main campus, uh, Wako, the Wako campus, and we, uh, in 2012, we relocate to uh, Tsukuba campus, where uh, the Riken, all the activities of the Riken BRC present. So uh, the, this is uh, uh, not only the 20th anniversary of Riken BRC, but also the 40th of JCM. Uh, this, so the last year we experienced uh, uh, very uh, serious uh, uh, disaster of uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, I would like to uh, what kind of regulations are, are uh, set it and uh, how we uh, work uh, under these regulated conditions. In 2020, April, from April 8, the Ken headquarters ordered all the Ken personnel to work from home. Uh, following the order, the Ken BRC suspended all the position distribution services until uh, May uh, 20th. So, the, uh, at, uh, by the end of the August, or some uh, regulations are remained. So uh, in this period, uh, five persons were assigned who engaged in essential tasks for maintaining uh, of our uh, microbial resources and preservation facility. They commute, they commuted one by one per day uh, during these uh, two months. And this period, in this period, most staff remotely accessed and worked on the in-house operating system in JCM and our databases via VPN. And JCM used the mailing system to respond to users' inquiry and share the, uh, this information uh, uh, among our JCM staff. And still, uh, <clears throat> After the uh, partial resumption of the position and distribution service, JCM staff uh, are uh, taking great care for social uh, distancing and for measures preventing infections. So still now, a number of persons working in the room was, uh, is restricted uh, according to the uh, weekend's uh, restriction levels, even now we somewhat continue the, this restriction and occasional work from home in order to prevent uh, cluster occurrence of infection, even if uh, staff, uh, staff are, are infected. So uh, we would like to, well, we <coughs> consider uh, we have to uh, prevent uh, cluster occurrence because our users uh, needs our uh, microbial resources for their research. So uh, we must uh, not, we must not uh, suspend uh, our services again. So uh, this is why we uh, uh, set forth the uh, uh, strict uh, uh, regulations, even after the uh, uh, regulation of RICAN uh, lifted. We also introduced remote monitoring system of preservation facilities such as deep freezers. Okay, uh, these, uh, uh, this slide shows the numeric data of, the, uh, 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 of our 
of activity in uh, last uh, fiscal years. We collected 708 strains. Uh, many of them came from overseas. But this number is, uh, was a slightly lower number than past, uh, mainly due to the COVID-19 effect. So, uh, as you know, the transfer uh, of the materials across the borders uh, a little uh, bit hampered. So, uh, this number is a little bit uh, smaller. And, and we now uh, hold uh, 30,000 strains. And the last fiscal year, we distributed 4,700 strains. And Thirty more than thirty percent went overseas, and around four, one fourth of the distribution went to profit organizations. And despite COVID uh, for uh, COVID nineteen, this is uh, the biggest, second biggest numbers uh, so far. So uh, maybe uh, the researchers uh, outside the Deccan or uh, many researchers. Uh, requires our resources, even though their activities are restricted due to COVID-19. And we also uh, take great care about our uh, quality of our strains. So at the time of the receiving the deposited strain, we check the, uh, the quality in terms of the viability, contamination, and the uh, uh, authenticity or identity of the uh, strains. And we found uh, more than 10% of the uh, deposited strain has some problems. And uh, we, uh, at the, uh, uh, in the case of the problematic, problematic deposited strain, we communicated with, uh, we communicated with uh, the depositors and asked them to resubmit uh, the authentic uh, high quality strains to our uh, institute. Okay, we uh, are predicted, we worked as a, uh, <clears throat> under the ISO 9001 uh, quality management system. And we also uh, work as a core facility of general microbes and the National Bioresource Project in Japan. Okay, this graph, uh, this slide shows our uh, changes of our JCM uh, catalogs, uh, published catalog and our holdings. As you, as you see in the photographs, uh, our uh, uh, cut JCM catalogs, published catalogs of strains from number one in 1983 to volume number 10 in 2007. The uh, uh, catalogs became thicker and thicker. And as you uh, shown in the uh, graphs, uh, which shows uh, uh, our accumulated number of holdings, and uh, the number of the holdings gradually increased. So, uh, with a sporadic or occasional uh, transfer, massive transfers from uh, as a uh, uh, corrections or as an institute. And I would like to emphasize that these, uh, uh, we now hold the 30,000 uh, uh, strains, but this number uh, can uh, not uh, reached, can be, cannot be reached in a short time. It takes a very long time, 40 years, to reach this uh, number, holding numbers. Okay, this graph shows uh, uh, our ratio of the, our distributions. So after uh, United into BRC in 2004, JCM distributed more than 66,000 strains in these 17 years. The most uh, distribution, of course, went to the domestic universities or a domestic institute, research institute, but also, uh, they went to the domestic for-profit organization around 25%. Uh, uh, and another one-fourth of our distribution went overseas. 
so uh, after the uh, distribution uh, users uh, uses our uh, JCM strain for their research and uh, they publish the uh, papers uh, as an outcome and uh, these numbers uh, 6500 original paper is an accumulated number of the 14 years uh, by uh, JCM users. So this number indicates that our contribution to research communities and these uh, papers include many uh, so-called top journals like uh, Nature or Science and uh, we, I think, uh, this number also uh, indicates our contribution uh, to the cutting edge research. And also, uh, we are contributing uh, to the research and development, innovation and society, as in, uh, evidenced by the large number of the patent publications, uh, 1,000, uh, near 1,400 patents that uh, use uh, our JCM strains. And the slide shows an, one example of commercialized product. So, uh, uh, Japanese companies uh, screen uh, our uh, uh, JCM strains and they found a lactic acid bacterium uh, that can activate a total immune system and they produce uh, the commercial products such as a daily uh, products or drinks or a tablet saying that these, uh, these food or uh, uh, these food or drinks uh, uh, can prevent uh, viral infection. The, this is a nice example of the uh, uh, contribution to uh, the uh, society. So this graph shows uh, our contribution to microbial research in Asia. So uh, from uh, in these seven years, we received the deposition uh, amounted to 3,000 strains from Asian researchers. And uh, uh, these depositors published uh, 1,400 papers uh, by describing these deposited uh, strains. And we distributed 7,800 strains to Asian uh, researchers and by using them, using the distributed strains, they published 1,300 uh, papers. Okay, these numbers uh, indicate that uh, JCM greatly uh, contributes to and is also uh, greatly supported by research in, in Asia. As you know, the microbial resource research activity is very high in uh, Asia. So uh, we would like to continue uh, this uh, activity or this service in order to uh, contribute more to the microbial uh, research in Asia. And uh, we are uh, now uh, uh, focused on the uh, value addition of our uh, uh, holdings, uh, our JCM strains. As you know, the genome sequence is a very important information associated with uh, 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 microbial resources. So under the NBRP genome information upgrading program, so uh, uh, we are uh, sequencing uh, hundreds of uh, JCM strains. Uh, and we have, uh, in collaboration with uh, other institute uh, researchers, uh, we uh, accomplished uh, outcomes uh, as described shown here in this slide. And we are now working uh, on, uh, in the international collaboration headed by the, uh, Dr. Ma and uh, his colleagues uh, in uh, WDCM and saying uh, the project is a GCM 10K type strain sequencing project uh, which aim to, uh, uh, to determine the genomic uh, information in all the uh, type, prokaryotic type strains. And we, are, uh, we would like to contribute uh, uh, this project 
and uh, more than uh, 1,800 type strains are scheduled under this project. And we uh, greatly appreciated uh, uh, this activity in uh, WTCM to, uh, because this is, uh, is very uh, valuable for our uh, activity or to enrich the uh, 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 information of our uh, JGM strains. Okay, it's, uh, we, uh, our, uh, we, uh, microbial BRCs are somewhat uh, uh, works as a research and development laboratories in order to respond demands of users and research communities. Uh, so the aim of the research in microbial BRC is the uh, enrichment of the holdings and their values and the enhancement of the use and research using resources. And research in microbial BRCs includes exploration of new resources or characterization of them or developing of related techniques. However, the research activity in MBRC is limited. So uh, we are uh, now uh, emphasize and uh, of the collaboration, on the collaboration with users or depositors. Uh, these collaborations are one of the ways to accomplish research effectively in microbial VRCs. Okay, this is the last slide. So, uh, responses to the user demands are important to improve our activity and to obtain the reliability and the status, enrichment of GSM collection and the value is important and tightly linked to our research activity, which requires collaboration with scientific community. We should take much into consideration of risk assessment, assessment for future contingency, as well as passing know-how to next generation by fostering human resource engagements in PRCs. So uh, this is uh, the importance of the sustainable development as a microbial PRCs. Uh, okay, this is the end of my talk. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Okuma, for that informative uh, presentation. And we um, just applaud the uh, efforts and the endeavors of JCM for being actively uh, contributing to science in spite of the pandemic. At this point, we can, I think, uh, entertain just one question. Since yep. um, we have a um, very uh, hectic schedule, uh, I, I don't see any Q question in the Q&A box. Uh, well, I can have one question. Uh, yep. About uh, risk assessment, uh, for you to have sustainable development of JCM, what is the major action that you have done for risk assessment? Yeah, so the uh, human resource is very important. So if one person, uh, for example, is infected by uh, COVID-19, uh, someone else can replace the, the, that person's work. So uh, we overlap the uh, uh, person's works mm -hmm. and among between the members or among the members uh, of our uh, GHM. So th this is one kind of the risk assessment. And of course, mm -hmm. uh, we uh, preserve the, uh, uh, the duplicate of our resources in the distant place. So the can has a, mm -hmm. uh, another campus in the no, uh, western part of the, uh, Japan, western part of Japan. So we preserve the copy, mm -hmm. duplicate. Uh, freezing duplicate in that campus, mm -hmm. so we share uh, the disk. Mm -hmm. so we can learn from that, so we will have some redundancy or duplicates or tri even triplicates of our cultures. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Okuma, and maybe some of us can collaborate with you again and again. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you very our much. Okay, our second speaker is um, a promising uh, biotechnologies. Um, he is Dr. Verova Champreda, Champreda, who is serving as the director of the Biorefinery and Bioproduct Technology Research Group 
at the National Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology or Biotech Thailand. Dr. Champreda finished his PhD at the Imperial College in London, United Kingdom. His main research interests include enzyme discovery through metagenomic technology, biomass conversion, enzyme applications in biorefinery. He is also working on developing green process for biomass fractionation and biocatalytic approach for the production of biofuels and commodity chemicals for renewable carbon resources. A prolific researcher, Dr. Chambreda authored more than 120 publications and is a recipient of local and international awards, including the Young Scientist Award in 2010, Young Artist Asian Biotechnologies Award in 2018 from Japan, and the Kuchi Award in 2019. Let us listen to Dr. Chambreda, who will share his presentation on how microbes contribute to PCG economy. The floor is yours, Dr. Chambreda. Okay, so thank you very much, the Chairman, for your very nice introduction. Today is my great pleasure to be here to give you the presentation in the topics. How microbes contribute to VCG economy? I think that is the uh, case for Thailand and also for international uh, research community as well. So, as you know, that now the world is stepping toward the edge of bioeconomy, right? And the uh, uh, BCG economy model has been adopted as the strategy for Thailand and many countries worldwide. B is stand for bio, C is stand for circular economy, and G is the stand for green economy. So in combination, uh, what BCG economy means is to use bio resources as the raw material for conversion uh, to uh, specific products of market interest and on very efficient recycling of the product using green technology. So uh, currently, the value of BCG economy in Thailand is worth 3.4 trillion Thai baht and equivalent to 21% of Thai GDP. And we expected that with the adoption of BCG economy model by the public sector and also promoted to the private sector, the value of the BCG economy in our country will be go up to 4.4 trillion Thai baht and equivalent to 24% of Thai GDP in the next five years. The main drivers the main industry that contribute to BCG in the countries include the food and agriculture, medicine and wellness, bioenergy and biochemicals, and uh, now we call bio refinery, right? And also, as you know, Thailand is very important. Tourism is creative economy. Bio industry and bio refinery is considered the key drivers for the BCG economy. As I mentioned, that BCG economy by definition is the conversion of raw materials, particularly renewable carbon from agricultural biomass using bioresource diversity. I can say that we can use microorganisms, right, uh, as the converter to convert the raw materials from agricultural sectors, uh, not only using the chemical process, but also the bio process for production of various high biofuels, biochemicals, both commodities and specialty chemicals, biomaterials, bioplastic, biopolymers, and biofunctional products that has uh, functional ingredients that use in um, food industry, in the normal feed industry, in healthcare industry, and in biopharma industry as well. So according to the map, so you can see that Thailand is now placed as one of the country among other countries in the world that has dedicated plan for developing bioeconomy. That is good news for us uh, as the research community. Uh, as I mentioned before, the strength of Thailand for selecting VCG as the economic model is that we have plenty of agricultural raw material. We have the worst source of agricultural products. Uh, we are top exporter of agricultural products to the world market. And therefore, we have plenty of biomass that available for bioconversion. Uh, along with, we are the hotspot, we are the hotspot of microbial biodiversity in the world. So altogether, this is a good platform for developing bioeconomy in Thailand. Currently, we, trans we convert raw sugar, cassava, and also palm oil, and I consider first generation raw material that are eatable to various health products, including biofuels, bioenergy, biochemicals, and bioplastic. And this is the major companies, the uh, stakeholders 
in Thailand that working in this area. But however, the questions, the issues for all the companies is that how to con on how to change for the use of the edible raw materials to non-edible one to extend the range of the starting material from sugar starch to uh, other kind of inexpensive raw materials and to expand the product portfolio from commodity fuels and chemical to the product with more spectrum and with higher value. At Biotech, what we are working on is that we screen for all these kind of bio products using for all these kind of bio products using two sources of microbial origins. The first is from TBRC, the Thailand Bio Resource Research Center. That is a big culture collection with standard one that now has more than 90,000 strains of microorganism and rank number one in Asia and number six in the world in terms of microbial diversity. In addition, we also screen the bio products from uncultured microorganisms using metagenomic technology. We have high throughput screening facility and the next generation sequencing platform in order to develop the good strain that capable of production of uh, the target bio products to, together with the good process and upscale it to the industrial process. The product we're working on is on enzymes, biochemical, bioactive compounds, functional ingredients, biopolymer, biocontrol agents. I will give you some of the uh, success case in uh, our work uh, later. Okay, so as I mentioned, right, TBRC is a very good culture collection in Thailand, right? We provide a, a service. Uh, we provide the microorganism not only for the research community, but for commercial applications as well. But, and they act as, let's say, the focal point uh, and linking to the network in culture collection in Southeast Asia as well. So for more information, you can visit their website. Okay, so nowadays, so not only the use of agricultural, agricultural product is considered, but also people think that, okay, there should be other kinds of feedstock that can use for bioconversion, including the direct use of carbon dioxide, the use of cellulosic biomass that we have plenty, the, the use of natural gas and biogas as the raw material by gas fermentation technology and use of industrial byproducts, such as in the case for Thailand, it's that we have Plenty of resources from biodiesel industry it should be a really good and inexpensive source for bioconversion. Okay, the workflow for our uh, research team in biotech is that we start from the culture collection in TBRC with a high throughput screening facility. We develop the strain, whether we can use this as the Y type or improve or improve the properties of the strain using synthetic biology or adaptive evolution and further upscale the bio process from very small scale in mini bio reactor to lab scale fermenter to pre pilot scale process and further to the pilot plant to in EECI biopolis. Some of the product that developed by our research group has been licensed to the private sector, such as small bio control agents, textile enzyme, data group can give you some examples later. Okay, so for the first product that I wanted to mention is enzymes. Enzyme is an uh, important bio product with a really big market and long history. Right? The global enzyme market now worth 5.4 billion USD per year. That is a really big market. Different kinds of enzymes can be used in different formats, including the use in the free the form of free enzymes, immobilized enzymes, cell surface display enzymes, or clone the genes and coding the enzymes into the post cell factory for developing consolidated uh, microbes for con direct conversion of the raw material to products. Some of our enzymes uh, has been licensed to the private company in Thailand, in including the animal feed enzyme, textile enzyme, some are also under development, but we close from uh, collaboration with the industry, including the personal care enzyme and enzymes for, for sugar modification and biomass conversion. The second examples of how to Use microbes in BCG economy is the uh, development of high performance yeast for biorefinery industry. So, currently, yeast saccharomyces is used for ethanol production, and the productivity of ethanol in Thailand is 4 million liters per day. That's quite a lot, right? However, uh, they are looking, they are looking for the alternative yeast strain that has better performance in their fermentation process. So we screen for thermoresistant saccharomyces from the TBRC collection. 
with heat tolerance and high ethanol productivity and therefore can reduce the fermentation cost and time. This strain has been licensed to uh, a big ethanol company in Thailand for trial already. Uh, the strain show improved performance on increasing ethanol productivity, enhancing raw materials utilization efficiency. And this strain can be used as a platform for further engineering using synthetic biology or adaptive evolution to uh, change it from production of ethanol to production of other biochemicals with higher value and the work is on progress. Another example is on the research on beta glucan, right? You know, beta glucan is a very important and very promising prebiotic, right? And uh, the global prebiotic market is now reaching 8.95 billion US dollar per year. And so it's a real big market. Many prebiotic exist in the market, including oligosaccharide and different, and different types of biopolymers. So we select a beta glucan biopolymer from a fungi called Ophiocordyceps dipterigenan that is also from the TBRC collection. And found that, okay, the beta glucan from this fungi have very uh, excellent properties compared to the conventional beta glucan that produced from yeast or from barley. So this is, has a higher molecular weight and highest chance for modification, right? So the first uh, product that we licensed to the company is now uh, in the market in the name of beta booster that used as the uh, functional ingredient in uh, to add into <clears throat> pet food enzymes for 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 dogs and for cats something like that. This is quite high. This quite high value. Uh, aiming for its prebiotic property and immune enhancement property. And uh, beta glucan from this fungi is now uh, further modified for its molecular weight since the beta glucan with different molecular weight has different properties have different bio properties. So now we modify the local weight of this beta glucan and we apply it in the cosmetic and food application uh, very shortly and the product will be very soon available in the market. Another example is the screen, uh, the screening of natural product for bioresources. That is that in biotech, we work on this topic for uh, nearly 20 years already, very long history. So, so starting from the richness of microbial biodiversity in biotech culture collection, so we screen for different kinds of bioactive compounds and test for its bioactivity, illustrate for its chemical structure. And then now we have a candidate for anti-tuberculosis, anti-diabetic, that mainly eatable mushroom that is uh, more easily accepted, anti-aging for cosmeceutical, anti-plant pathogen. And currently we have more than 350 pure compounds in our chemical library that uh, are together with 3,500 crude extract in the library that are uh, now available. And we are very happy for international collaboration for extending the application of our chemical library. Okay, the last example is on the production of biochemicals, right? So not only we can use the wine type microorganisms as the producer, but we can also engineer or adapt the microbes for production of target chemicals of interest. So as in this case, we use synthetic biology to design the yeast, um, main, uh, mainly we work on yeast, for production of uh, different kind of bioproduct by design the pathway that uh, uh, leading to production of the target product together with cloning the enzymes that relevant to the use of the raw materials, right? So we construct the yeast for production of the lactic acid for bioplastic for carotene oil for healthcare products and also for terpene for high value for grants. The work is on good collaboration with the industrial partner. Another example is the use of adaptive evolution to develop the high performance yeast strain for production of xylitol. Xylitol is a very important sweetener with growing market, right? We select a strain of non saccharomyces yeast from the culture collection and we adapt the strain for tolerance to higher xylose concentration in the starting material and to and for tolerance to inhibitors in the heavy cellulose hydrolysate. So you see that this is the performance of the adaptive evolution strain ADP2, and this is the performance of the native strain at higher cellulose concentration as the raw material. You can see the very good performance of the adaptive evolution strain. And, uh, and the strain can be now applied for testing of cellular production with the industry.
okay, my last slide is right, is on the uh, just give you the the, the information that we will have the uh, EEC Biopolis open in the Eastern Economic Corridor of Innovation shortly in 2024. We we have the world class bio uh, pilot plans for bio process and chemical process for upscaling of our research and we will be open for research community uh, shortly in the three, in the next three years. Okay, we want to thanks for all our partner in the industry and in the private sector and the ANRCC 2021 committee. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That's very impressive, Dr. Chinbreda, and for all the hard work. Uh, at this point, we can only have one question because we will proceed with the poster, the flash talk. Um, do we have any question from the chat box, from the Q&A box? Well, okay. So it appears that there is a very positive relationship between biotech Thailand and uh, um, the industry. Uh, could you cite uh, what is the key factor for such good relationship between the research uh, sector and the industrial sector? Okay, so firstly, I can say that in order to develop the technology for the industrial sector, we need to see uh, in different aspects, not only the technical aspect, but on the regulation aspect as well, it's related to, to law, to IP, something like that. And the good thing is that uh, at NASDAQ, we have all the team that working in different aspects together, and we have a big team to work with the industry. And I think this is our strong point for collaboration with the industrial sector. Thank you for that. It's very positive atmosphere no? for the research being turned into uh, viable products and technology and industry. At this point, I'd like to thank all of the, our distinguished speakers, Professor Okuma and Dr. Champreda for the very informative and comprehensive presentation of microbial resource centers and uh, the utilization of microorganisms for BCG economy. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Oxy, and thank you all the speakers in the first sessions. Okay, now I would like to invite everyone to the poster session. One of the events highlights to show researcher potential and creativity. And this year is very different from previous year because it is the first time we ask participants to submit their posters via Twitter. And the presenters in this poster session are selected authors submitted to ANRC online Twitter that are either the most retweeted posters and posters selected by ANRC board members. Each presenter will have five minutes for flash talk and I will give you a signal 30 seconds before the time is up and exactly three minutes for Q&A, which will be from the board and speaker panelists. For other participants, please submit the questions in the Q&A box. And because of the time limit, I'm afraid I will have to select only some questions to ask to the presenters. Now, without further ado, we will start from, um, okay, we will start from Likia Endo. Uh, and this time we'll start when the slide is shown on the screen. Okay. Okay, you're on. Over to you. Times. Okay, see Tama. Oh dear. Okay, time start now. I don't ah, hear sorry. you. Okay. Sorry, freezed. Okay. Again. We will. Please wait. No. So, all, organizer will share all the slides for you. Okay.
Okay, now it's here. Yeah, this thank you, Boris. Sorry. Oh. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, please. Okay. Sorry. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Rikia Endo from Rikian Bioresource Research Center, Japan. Uh, it's my great pleasure to have the opportunity to present our works here at ANRRC. Uh, in this brush talk, I'm going to introduce our uh, ongoing project, development, development of Maudi Tohmas data that enables rapid identification of various uh, microbes, which is supported by the National Bioresource Project, Japan. I'd like to call your attention because this is an ongoing project. So your request on our project will make a difference in the future. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. Uh, now I'd like to share with you the motivation of uh, our works. Uh, Maudi Tokumas is a newly uh, emerging technology for species identification of microbes by providing cellular proteins. Uh, this technology enables more rapid, uh, easier, and more cost-effective way to identify microbial species. So this can be a good alternative to uh, similarity search of nucleotide sequences, what we call uh, blast search, as you know. So this figure shows, uh, upper figure shows a typical workflow of Maudi Tokumas. Uh, when you get the uh, fresh microbial culture, you can quickly learn the pipeline. Namely, after simple extraction, you can soon mount the samples to the device, get the uh, mass spectra, and then get the uh, rapid identification based on the similarity of mass spectra uh, to references. However, this, there is a critical uh, weak point of this technology, that is, Reference mass spectra currently available consist of mainly pathogenic bacterial species only, namely uh, reference mass spectra are limited at this moment. To overcome this weakness, we are now working hard. Uh, these are solutions uh, that we propose. In order to develop new reference data, uh, three microbial culture collections in Japan are collaborating and getting mass spectra using various microbial strains, including bacteria, filamenta fungi, and yeasts, irrespective of pathogenicity. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, this slide summarizes materials and methods. Uh, briefly, uh, establish, uh, first establish the standard conditions for mass spectra acquisition, and then perform repeated mass spectra acquisition followed by validation. Now we are planning to publicize the new reference mass spectra library in the next year period. At the same time, we will launch the quality control using Maudi Tohmas. Our target uh, covers various microbes, uh, including yet to be analyzed species. So we will finish in total 1,700 strains in collaboration with three, the three culture collections. Uh, the lower part uh, I showed these are uh, just examples of our target. Uh, that's too wide variety to describe all here. So if you are interested in the detailed information, please uh, feel free to contact us. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, here are the progress uh, reports. Uh, until now, uh, we have got uh, new mass spectra data for more than 1,400 microbial strains. With this progress, uh, we confirmed that actually more various microbial species can be identified using even our beta data of new mass spectra library. Just for example, uh, more various uh, Malassezia species and star Merela species, both of which are uh, East genera, uh, can be successfully identified. In addition, uh, misidentification of microbial strains can be quickly <laughs> detected using Maldi Tokmas. So I believe that uh, Maldi Tokmas is a very powerful tool for in house quality control for microbial resources. Namely, our project ex expands the potential 
of Maori tokmas for microbial resources. So please stay tuned with us and feel free to contact, contact us if you have any questions and requests. That's all of my presentation. Thank you very much for your watching. Thank you very much for perfect timing. Um, are there any questions from the board and speakers, please? So if, uh, are there any general uh, problem with these techniques when you use with uh, various, um, you know, type or uh, various um, types of uh, organisms? Uh, now, uh, official uh, uh, spectral library cons mainly consists of uh, European and uh, uh, American uh, strains, not Asian strains. So, if we use, uh, if we try to identify uh, Asian strains using Maori tofumas, it's not suitable at this moment. So, we, we should add more uh, Asian strains to the reference library. This is a big problem. Very interesting. Um, I thought that it would be something to do with the um, the machine, but actually the strains have problem with that as well. I don't know that. Okay. Yeah. Are yeah. there any, any other questions from the... Oh, okay. I can see there's some... We have, if we have Shimatsu platform, how can we use and compare our data with your MS library? Uh, at this moment, it's not, uh, our data is not compatible with uh, Shimatsu platform, but uh, we are now uh, enterprising the, we will expand the uh, compatibility of uh, platform to platform. So uh, stay tuned, please stay tuned with us. Thank you very much for that hope, and uh, we hope that we can have uh, this kind of collaboration going on in the future. Yes. Thank you. So Thank that's you, all we time. We have time for uh, Mr. Dr. Endo, and uh, now I would like to move to the second speaker, which is Ms. Supatra Kittikun from Thailand. Um, Okay, your slide will be here in a minute. And your time will start once the slide's on. Okay. Come on out. She's here. She's here already, but uh, the slides. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, okay, good. We wait for your slide now. Uh, Ms. Supatra, could you share your slide, please? Yeah. I, we don't have yours for some reason. Okay. Are, are you okay? If not, we can share the... Okay, okay, good. Please go on. Start now. Good morning, everyone. I am Supatha Kutikun, a research assistant at Thailand Bio Resource Research Center in Biotech Thailand. Today, I would like to present my poster with the title of Water Hyacinth, a Potential Substrate for Bioplastic Production using an engineer E. coli TBRC DMTC 118. The benefits of this work are twofold. First, it shows a, a way for waste utilization, and second, it promotes the sustainable production of bioplastics for green bioeconomy.
Your sound. Your sound. Okay. Sorry. What I have seen is uh, recognize a verbose aquatic weed. This weed can go very easily and quickly in most environment with water. Most importantly, it is a soft wood plant with high sugar content. So it is really attractive subject for making value added compound. In this study, uh, we demonstrated make uh, a simple water hyacinth pretty treatment to remove lignin and lily sugar from the plant and using those sugar for production of polyhydroxyl alkanoate or PHA by using an engineer E. coli. We use this uh, PBRC DMTC 118 equalized stain because we developed this stain to change a steel core A into PSA. For the treatment process, the water has been weed was chopped into small pieces and hydrolyzed into 1% sulfuric acid at high temperature. Uh, so, sugar were, were released from the pan into a solution. We measure the amount of uh, reducing sugar and the high dose solution uh, was used as a carbon source for the engineer E. coli to convert sugar into PSA. Then the product properties were investigated. Uh, water hyacinth is low of lignin content with high content of cellulose and hemicellulose. Our results show that a simple pretreatment by acid hydrolysis at high temperature can be an effective method to release sugars from the plant. From figure one, the engineer E. coli can go well in one to two percent of water hyacinth solution, indicating that the hydrolysis solution has a lot of sugar and the E. coli can use the sugar as a carbon salt. Moreover, PSA can be produced by this E. coli strain, and then PSA can be uh, used in production of bioplastic copolymer. In conclusion, water hyacinth is a promising source of biopolymer and biofuel production. Higher yield of PSA production will be further optimized in terms of treatment method and growth condition. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very fast. <laughs> uh, quicker than five minutes. Okay. So are there any questions from the audience, from the yeah, from the board or panelists? I will not ask questions for this poster. So please, anyone? Um, okay, the board member, could you please ask questions for this poster? Uh, your, your sound, your sound, yes, please have your mic on. Okay, if there is no question for this, we will go further to the next speaker. Thank you, Ms. Patra. Thank you. Okay, for the next speaker is Dong Ti Le. Um, okay. Okay. Miss uh, Doctor, uh, I'm not sure, Mr. or Mr. I don't see you yet. Could you have your camera on, please? Tong Le? Your slide is already here. Okay. Okay. Can you can you say something so we know that you can 
your, uh, your... yeah can you hear okay. me can you yes. hear me yes. and my screen yes we can see your screen and we can hear you okay so would you like yeah. to start now yeah. okay please start yes i can yeah uh hi everyone my name is Jung and i'm from vietnam academy of science and technology today i would like to introduce to you my our research uh, that focuses on exploration of endophytic fungi from Isura China seed plant and their potential campotensin producing. My presentation is divided into four parts, mm -hmm. and now I will go to background information. Camp uh, cancer is the first origin cause of death before leap, and uh, a patient should spend from ten to thirty thousand dollars per month for lung cancer. The camptotensin and its analogs are used as, uh, camto, uh, as uh, drunk cancer. Uh, this compound was first discovered from camptotica accumulate plant. Each year, one ton raw material camptotensin is required for a global market, and uh, this amount is over exploitation for this plant. Uh, that uh, situation demonstrates the diverse uh, source and large scale production camptotensin are critical. That's why microorganisms is, uh, are uh, atten uh, attract attention from researchers on the world because it can last a stale fermentation and rapid growth. Uh, some endophytic fungi has been reported uh, to produce camptotensin such as the Aspergillus and Trichoderma from uh, Camptotica accumulate. Uh, Besides uh, this plant, uh, several Isura genus plants also contain Camptotica. Uh, example Isura cococinia uh, were reported as a Camptotensin uh, producing plant and anti cancer drug uh, in the previous research. Whereas uh, Isura chinensis uh, is widely cultured or grown naturally in Vietnam. Its flower extracts uh, so inhibit, uh, completely inhibit all kinds of tumor. However, no public patient relates camptotensin or endophytic fungi uh, and other relates in this plant were report. Uh, that is motivation, motivation for our team to explore endophytic fungi from Isura chinensis and their potential camptotensin producing. To clarify uh, that hypothesis that relates to um, Isura China seeds, we uh, isolate endophytic fungi from this plant, then uh, morphological and genetic analyze it. Uh, after that, we also screen uh, camptotensin uh, producing uh, by TLC and SBLC uh, using cell biomass and uh, cell free blood extraction. And can you see here? We uh, have uh, endophytic fungi collection, including 30 uh, isolates that's assigned to uh, uh, 13 in general. And we also prove uh, that uh, 11 endophytic fungi strains uh, can produce uh, camptotensin that belong to uh, Phyllotixa, Colectotixum, Penicillium, Pomosis, and Diapotea. Uh, among them, uh, Pomosis uh, SPI2T2 uh, strains so high amount of cam uh, camptotensin with concentration over 2 mg per liter after 7 day culture. And uh, so all of the data reports uh, an overview of diversity of endophytic fungi in Isura China seed plant in Vietnam. Uh, and provide uh, the potential camptotensin producing of their endophytic member. Uh, however, that is the first uh, that all data about. Uh, that is the first step in our study. Now we are planning to confirm camptotensin molecular structure and uh, cytotoxic uh, and act anti-cancer effect uh, from our endophytic fungi. Besides, we also uh, analyzed who genome to find camptotensin synthesis cycle from our strain. My presentation is in the end. Thank you for your attention. Thank well, thank you. Well, thank you very much for the very good timing presentation and um, so, are there any questions for Dong Lee? 
Yes, uh, Lily. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Zhongli. Uh, okay. Is it? Yes. Uh, okay. That's no? good. Okay. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Also. Yeah, okay. I can. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Miss Dongli, for that uh, interesting topic. Uh, what type of cancer agents are targeting? Like, uh, what are the possible assay methods that you will be using for the bioassay for anti-cancer agents? Dong Lee? Uh, uh, sorry, can you repeat your question? Yes, uh, I know that you will be testing for anti-cancer drugs, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, what are the uh, target cancer cell lines and uh, assay method that you are performing for the uh, compounds from dopitic uh, panchai? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, actually, we can uh, we can choose uh, several type of cancer uh, for uh, test the effects of chemotherapy. Uh, example, we can you are. Um, so, uh, 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 press or, uh, uh, sorry, uh, previous moment, I mean, it. Sorry, I, I didn't get your answer. Hello? Yeah, can you, can you hear me? Yes, now, yeah. Could you give me your answer? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we can, yeah, we will try uh, chemotherapy extraction from our endophytic fungi uh, to uh, uh, breast or lung or uh, uh, colon cancer cells. Okay, uh, for colon, colon cancer cell lines and lung. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. So what assay method yeah, yeah. are you using? Assay, bioassay method. Uh, as uh, thus, uh, we uh, now we just uh, we has planned to try it uh, uh, to test the uh, cytotoxic for okay. cell and just uh, have a several is for um, effects on cancer cells. Okay. All right. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank yes. you. Thank you, Zhang Li. Thank and you thank for your you. Question. Yeah. Thank you, Alsi, for the questions. And I want to move next to to the next speaker, uh, Dr. Panya Pon Hum Kiao. Right. Okay. So, would you like to share your? Oh, okay. We share your slide for you. Would you like to start now? Okay. Hi, everyone. Okay. My name is Panya Pankel, and thank you so much for giving me a share and to present You have to app. speak louder as well. Thank you. Thank you for the chance to give us, to give me a chance to present our app microbiome project. And the title is Variant Strategy for Improvement of uh, Genomic DNA Use for Air Microbiome Analysis. The R is a very important because they play a key role of the global microorganism cycling and is a major source of human microbial exposure. Although the air contain diverse microorganisms, not much has been explored regarding air microbiome, partly because there is a usually low biomass of microorganisms in the air. In this work, in order to collect the enough microorganism for further analysis, different studies has been investigated. A microbiome is a collective term for diverse microorganisms in the air. They come from a variety of environment source. This microorganism largely affects to our health of uh, every living organism includes our health. Aside from the human activity, several factors influence the, the uh, microbiome, including particle size, airflow, and humidity. 
as the taxonomy and community composition of airborne microbial organism has a large impact on health, agricultural productivity, and atmospheric process. It is beneficial to investigate the diversity and dynamic of a microbiome. So, strategy to increase the efficiency of microbial collection and genomic DNA extraction for this work are highly advantageous. So, in this work, by aerosol sampling, we use MDS airport and polyether cell phone filter membrane to collect the bio aerosols. And also different strategy has been investigated, including DNA extraction improvement methods, effect of a volume on DNA use, or effect on membrane part size on DNA use. And also with this accredited orange for cell staining. We compare the efficiency of the several methods to extract the DNA, the genomic DNA from the air. And the DNA yield show that the conventional method with our modification show high of show higher DNA recovery when compared with the normal conventional and the commercial DNA extraction kit. Um, this result show that our method is good for a microbiome DNA extraction. When we use the difference uh, volume, we saw that uh, when we collect the air at the 10,000 liter to 15,000 liter, the results show high level of DNA is about four times compared to 7,500 liter of air. And our genomic DNA can be used and successfully for 16S RDNA amplification as shown in the finger four. And the pore size of the filter also significantly uh, influence the recovery of the DNA yield. DNA recovery and amount of cell which collected from the cellopoid Micron of filter membrane show high than 0.45 micron of filter membrane, as you can see in figure three and figure six. In another experiment, much lower of DNA U were obtained from, from a from door compared to the outdoor sample. And this DNA U are directly related to PM 2.5 and PM 10, as shown in the finger five. From this result, efficient air collection and DNA extraction method will be highly beneficial for analyzing indoor air microbiome. And that's all of my presentation. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Pandyapon. Um... I think we have a question in the chat box. Uh, can your technique be used to detect DNA of pathogenic microorganisms in the air? Yes, of course. We, our technique can be can be detected. Okay. Would you like to elaborate why, or how, or what? <laughs> you know, make it uh, uh, well, for the detecting of pathogenic, we, we, we can select the primer for that pathogenic to, to, to detect the, the pathogenic in, in the aerosol. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions from the executive board? Uh, I can hear someone saying something. Can you make it louder? It's Jane. I, I just wondered what locations you used to collect the samples from. Which different, what different areas did you use as your test sites? I we uh, we collect the air sample at the NASDA building of the of the NASDA between like indoor side as you, you see here indoor side we we just sampling our air in the in the indoor part and outdoor area here 
okay. of our Nasda beauty. So, so you've not tried it in the uh, in the middle of a busy city, for example, and seeing if there's a difference. Can 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 you repeat your uh, your question? Can Sorry, you I just wondered if you tried to collect it in, say, the middle of a busy city, a major city, I, or you know, if, yes, if yes, you found a yes. difference. Yes, of course. We we have planned to to go to 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 sampling that from that area, from the the crowd people area yeah. to compare. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Rose. Okay, thank you, Jane, for the questions. And um, are there any more? If not, I want to thank Dr. Panyapon for the presentation. Now thank the you, last, sir. thank you. So the last poster presenter will be Arisaldo E. Castro. Okay, thank you. Are you ready? Okay, you Jane. So you have, please have your mic on. Thank you. Would you like to start now? Okay, go. All right, so good morning, everyone. Um, according to the United Nations, by the year 2050, 5 billion people will suffer from water scarcity due to climate change and unsustainable human activities. Sorry. I'm not sure what happened. Okay, can you still see my slides? No, no. Oh, maybe it's some technical error. Just please wait. Sorry. Um, let me... Okay, please wait. We will share the slide for you. Okay. 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 All right, sorry. Um, again, uh, according to the United Nations, by the year 2050, 5 billion people will suffer from scarcity of water due to climate change and unsustainable human activities. Next slide. The changing trends on freshwater availability in our planet is alarming and should make us think about how we should uh, manage our surface water reservoir. Developing countries are expected to increase their population more significantly than others. Therefore, scarcity of clean water will definitely be a major concern in these regions. Next slide. In our country, in the Philippines, water supply shortages are becoming more frequent than ever, especially in the country's capital, in Metro Manila. Next slide. Inefficient economics, as well as lack of scientific evidence on overall quality of water supply and resources contribute to more people suffering from waterborne diseases. Next slide. Okay. Now, a particular issue that has a dearth of scientific evidence is contamination of aquatic resources by emerging pollutants such as heavy metals, antimicrobial agents, and endocrine disrupting chemicals that all jeopardize the integrity of water resources and subsequently affect the quality of the drinking water supply. With this research gap, we decided to conduct our study. Next slide. And so our study on microbial quality indicators and environmental pollutants in drinking water and resources in Mega Manila. So uh, next slide, please. Recognizing that there are potential negative health impacts of long-term consumption of contaminated water, we did this scoping review to describe the current state of knowledge on drinking water and resources in Mega Manila. Next slide. We did, we did keyword-based and manual searching of relevant published literature from international and local databases, as well as uh, sourcing of regulatory data from national government agencies. Afterwards, selected literature were evaluated and appraised in terms of their relevance, reliability, their validity, and applicability. Data and findings from quality check literature and regulatory reports underwent secondary analysis and qualitative summaries. Next slide. After filtering and appraising, we were able to have a total of 46 literature as data sources. We found out, next slide please, that the average number of publications on microbiological and chemical quality of drinking water and resources 
per million population is only at 0.02, so that's very small. In the last two decades, we can say that there is no increasing trend in terms of the publication of, uh, published li of, of literature on water quality. Next slide. In terms of sources of regulatory data, we were able to acquire a total of 37 reports. So we captured regulatory data from these reports and we did our succeeding qualitative summaries and secondary analysis. So uh, the, the primary or the key findings that we found out are as follows. Next slide. First, publications focused on microbial isolation and identification, sidelining issues on emerging chemical and biological contaminants, as well as antimicrobial resistance in water. Second, next slide, microbial quality of inland water bodies within Mega Manila are far different from that of drinking waters. Waters from, from these inland bodies follow a different set of quality parameters to ensure safety and acceptability. In addition, from principal component analysis, we found out that primary factors influencing the nature of water in inland water bodies of Mega Manila include nitrate, fecal coliform, and biological oxygen demand. Lastly, uh, next slide, we found, uh, or from, from the data that we, we uh, curated and we analyzed, uh, we found that there is consistency in the quality of drinking water distributed in Mega Manila as justified by the water quality index values that were reported. Next slide. As our key message, uh, we argue that the detection of antimicrobial resistance genes in both marine and freshwater sources of Mega Manila, complex with the lack of studies on AMR in drinking water, calls for a review of existing national research priorities in environmental and public health. Next slide. In light of our major findings, we propose three recommendations. We, as we propose to assess the microbial quality and potential AMR emergence in water resources that are not only within Mega Manila. Second, we propose to have a review of the current Philippine national standards for drinking water, given that there are multiple published reports on the detection and quantification of emerging contaminants, probably consider the potential inclusion of other water quality parameters as assessment metrics. And lastly, we propose that there should be a combination of isolating and detecting specific microbial groups of interest and AMR effectors such as genes, biocides, and other chemical pollutants to really uh, elucidate uh, what's happening in the uh, water in the different aquatic resources. Uh, that ends my presentation. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Um... Dr. Castro for the presentation and uh, are there any questions for him? So a quick question, um, how, how would you test for the AMR in the, in the water? Okay, so there are various methods um, like you, uh, number one, we can detect drug resistant bacteria, and also we can experiment on the rates of uh, drug resistance by uh, control by exposing them in a, an in vitro setup. So aside from that, another another possibility is detection of genes. So detection and quantification of antimicrobial resistance genes is also an indicator of potential emerging AMR in water. Right. Thank you. Um, okay, I think maybe we have to move on a little bit. Uh, yes, yeah, so thank you very much, Castro, for the, the presentation. And uh, thank you, everyone, again, for your inspiring presentations. And we appreciate your dedicated work that significantly contributes to the poster session. And the result of the best posters will be revealed at the end of today during the closing session, so please stay tuned. And now it's time for the lunch break and the next session will begin at 1.30 Bangkok time. And for the executive board, please go to the link that we sent you uh, by email earlier. And the executive board meeting will start at maybe 12.10, okay, Bangkok time. So see you at the other link. And for everyone else, see you at 1.30. Thank you.